Word of God speak. Shouldn't that be all of our prayers? That the, that the Word of God would speak to us, would talk to us, that God would communicate with us. I hear so often, I just wish God would speak to me. And we're not opening our Bible when we pray that. That's how God talks to us. Can He talk to us in other ways? Absolutely, and He does. But the Word of God speaks to us. So let's, let's bow our heads and pray that it would do that this morning. Father, thank You for such beautiful worship. Thank You, Lord, that Your Word does speak to us. And so, Father, as we open Your Word this morning, we pray again that You would speak to us through it, that You would teach us and help us to understand what it is that You have for us this morning. Thank You, Jesus. Amen. Well, today is our Membership Sunday. It's the day where we celebrate once a year those who have chosen over the last year to become members of our church. Um, but I've been asked this question a lot, and I think there's validity to the question, is local church membership a biblical process? Is it a, it, does, it, does local church membership violate scriptural principles? After all, don't we read in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Universal Church and the communion of saints. If I'm part of the Catholic, the Universal Church, why should I be asked to join a local church? If our doctrine acknowledges that all believers are members of the church of Christ simply by the nature that they're followers of Christ, then why should we attach ourselves to a church within the church? Consider these words of the Apostle Paul when he's writing to Corinth. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, Apollos, aren't you merely being human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord has assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. But God gave the growth. So neither he who plants or he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive wages according to their labor. For we are God's fellow workers. If you are God's field, God's building. Isn't Paul, couldn't we change that from Apollos and Paul to Baptist and Methodist? What if we said this? For when, when one says, I am Baptist, and another says, I am Methodist, are you not merely being human? What then is Baptist? What then is Methodist? We are quick to divide in the Christian community. And, and it's not new to us. It's been, it's been happening since Paul was leading churches and planting churches. So, with that in mind, is it biblical and scriptural to belong to a local church, to tie yourself to a local church. Well, I think since this is Membership Sunday, you can guess that I'm going to say that it is. But just saying it is doesn't tell you why. So this morning, while we're going to look at the fact that there's no direct biblical command to join or refrain from joining a local congregation, there are scriptural principles that are taught in the Bible that lead us to understand why joining a local body of believers through membership was God's design. Let's look at five scriptural ideas that help us to come to this conclusion. The first is that church membership is implied through the metaphor of being the body of Christ. 
Romans 12, 4 and 5. Now, as we have many parts in one body, not all the parts have the same function. In the same way, we who are many in one body in Christ individually are members one of another. 1 Corinthians 12. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greatest honor. And our unrepresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. which our more presentable parts do not require. For God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. In the age of watching church online or on TV or on a mobile app, this idea gets missed. I hear all the time, I, I, between here and Gregory, I get talked to on a regular basis. Oh, I watch you every week. God bless you. But come here. Come here. I'm glad you're engaging. But that's such a small part of what God has called us to as we worship. I, hear, I heard this week, somebody said to me, I can be a Christian without coming to church. And you know what? I'm the first one to admit absolutely you can. But you can't be the church by staying at home. Now, online services are good. Being able to do that is fantastic. Being able to watch. Some people work Sunday mornings or Saturday nights when there's church services and they just can't get to them. That makes sense. Some people are homebound or traveling. And that's why we kind of offer these online options. But a Christian without going to church leaves part of the body alone. Leaves part of the body all by itself. The idea Paul makes very clear is that we need each other. If you're a Christian and you say, well, I don't need the church, you don't understand. We absolutely need the church. Whether you're a preacher, teacher, custodian, office manager, committee member, funeral, food server, pew sitter, it doesn't matter. None of us can effectively live the Christian life on our own. I need you and the accountability and the friendship so that I can walk in integrity with Jesus Christ. And you need that too. It was never God's design that we live our lives apart. Look at the early church. The early church got together daily and shared their lives, shared their struggles, held each other up, defended each other, encouraged each other, corrected each other. Paul talks about being parts of a body. I've learned, as many of you have, through broken bones, that I can get along for a while without a foot. But I'm not whole. I'm not the way I was intended to be. And the foot that's out there on its own, apart from the body, is completely useless, frankly, to the rest of the church. And the church is God's design. It wasn't Jesus' plan for the foot to be out wandering the world by itself. 
We need each other. The body needs to support the body. That's the first point. The second point in Scripture is that we are required to submit to a shepherd. To pastors, Paul says this, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church which He obtained with His own blood. Be careful to be a good shepherd. What frightening words those are, frankly. That doesn't leave any wiggle room for me to take advantage of the sheep. To the church, the writer of Hebrews says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be no advantage to you. I know pastors that are just shredded on a regular basis by their church. That's not the, that's not the idea. Paul says for us as a church to submit to our church leaders. I'm not, a, I'm not immune from that as a pastor. I have people above me that I have to answer to. And I willingly do that because that is God's plan. Having leaders over us is a fact of life. We all know this. The reason for that is because that is what God has planned for His people. This is true in society, and it's true in the church. The church is the one really who sets the idea of leadership. God says that civil leaders will be held responsible to how they lead us. They're to do it in a godly way, building up the people that, they, that answer to them. And there's accountability with that, as it says in the book of Hebrews. In the Methodist church, we have our episcopacy. We're led by bishops who oversee multiple conferences. In fact, this week, the globe, the brand new, finally not transitional anymore, global Methodist church is having their convening conference. And this week, one of the things they'll be doing is setting into play what it means to have bishops and how many bishops we'll have and who will be, um, who will be over each area and what that's going to look like. Underneath the bishops are conference superintendents and uh, assistant superintendents. They oversee multiple presiding elders, or what, what the church used to call district superintendents. And these presiding elders oversee multiple pastors, or elders, or deacons, shepherds. We all answer to somebody, and several somebodies sometimes. I answer to a presiding elder, to a district superintendent and assistant superintendent, and then to a bishop. And that's God's plan. To be obedient to God, we can't, we can't submit to these leaders grumbling. He says submit to them and enjoy, enjoy and willing obedience. We can't do that if we're not a submitted part of a local congregation. The third is that we're to submit to the church in discipline. This is something Americans don't like to hear. We don't like the idea that a church has disciplinary authority over us. After all, you're there to make me feel good when I come and then leave me alone. But that's not God's plan. Jesus says this in Matthew. He's talking about how to handle conflicts within the body of Christ. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. You know how rare that is? 
Can I drop a little truth bomb? There are people that get angry with me here. Some of it's legitimate because I'm a guy and I put my foot in my mouth and I hurt people's feelings. I've done that. Some of it, maybe not so much. But do you know how many have come to, in, in all of my years as a pastor, who have come to me and said, Tony, I don't like what you said. I don't like what you did. None. I hear it through the grapevine. I hear it through the gossip train. Every time. But no one comes to me. Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may established, be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen, tell it to the church. So Jesus Himself, who's kind of our model and example, right? Sets up the idea of what we should do when there are problems within the church. And He makes it clear that we're to clean ourselves up. We're not to let problems go, but the first thing we do is in love and humility with the goal of peace and restoration, we go to that person that we think is either sinning or has hurt us, and we say, hey, brother, sister, this happened, or you're doing this, and I don't think this is God's plan for you. And I'm here to say, how can I walk through this with you so that we can bring you back to living the way the Gospel calls us to live? And so, if, if you find out that I'm cheating on my wife, I'm not. But if you find that out, you come to me one-on-one -on -one and you say, hey, Tony, what are you doing? You can't do that. You need to repent. And the call then would be I would fall on my face and repent and confess to you that I had done this wrong. What if I say, hey, you mind your own business? Then Scripture says you go get one or two elders and you, you, you bring those one or two in. Don't, don't talk about it anywhere else. Go bring those one or two elders in. And the three of you, two of you, go talk to that person and try again. And then if that doesn't work, Jesus says, put it in front of the entire church for church discipline. And if repentance doesn't come, there's more to do. And we'll talk about that second. But the idea is that the church should be so holy that we, we in love hold ourselves accountable. If I'm doing something wrong and you don't hold me accountable, shame on you because I would want to know and repent. We often kind of get turned sideways. I'm going to do Donna's funeral this week. It's going to be hard. You know I hurt her feelings? I heard her really bad. And I didn't have any idea. But she came to me. We had a conversation. And she called me on the carpet. And I was thankful. And I got to apologize to her. And I got to explain what I meant, but then I saw from her perspective what it was that I said that caused the pain. If she wouldn't have told me, I'd have never known. I couldn't have confessed. I couldn't have learned. Right? Was it sin? Not necessarily. It just wasn't, I didn't communicate well. But because she was willing to tell me, I was able to ask her for her forgiveness and fix that relationship. That's what we're called to do in the church. To be different than the world. But we can't do that if we're not holding each other in love as a family accountable. And we can't hold each other accountable if we're not part of a church. If we're not committed to each other through this idea of membership. 
The horrible part of this process is the idea of excommunication. Jesus finishes that previous thought by saying this, If he refuses to listen to even the church, let him be as a Gentile or outsider and a sinner, a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Pentecostals and people who take the Bible out of context use that bound in heaven and loosed in heaven very freely sometimes. But that is specifically talking about the process of church discipline. And when the church confronts somebody in sin that's unwilling to repent, we're to put them out. It's called excommunication. Now, that's not a permanent thing. If they repent, we're supposed to then welcome them back into the body. But it's not a Tony and Clint Vanneman and Mick as head of SPR do this thing. It's done by the whole church. And then the whole church receives them back in love if they repent. Paul builds on this instruction when he commands the church to put away someone who is in sexual sin. We read this in 1 Corinthians 5. He says, what do I have to do with judging outsiders? We're told not to judge. You know that. But that's such a warped process. We are absolutely not to judge the people who don't claim that they are followers of Christ. You can't hold them to a, a level of account for a belief system they don't have. But Paul says, is it not those within the church that we are supposed to judge? Truly I say to you, oops, that's the wrong one, God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. We aren't supposed to allow open rebellious sin in the church. The problem today that Paul's life didn't have when you were in Corinth, there was one church. And if you wanted to go and worship God, that was your option. Today, if we enforce church discipline, they can go right down the street to the Baptist church or the Lutheran church or the Presbyterian church or wherever they want and start all over again. That's where Jesus' words, if you bind it on earth, it's bound in heaven, come into play. If church discipline is, is put in play, in practice, if somebody comes under the judgment of church discipline, they can go somewhere else that, 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 that family doesn't know, but until they repent, God still holds them to that. Church discipline is one of the most loving things we can do when we do it right because it calls someone who is walking apart from God to repentance. Of course, you can do it wrong, can't you? We've all seen that. But when we do it right, when we do it in love, it's the idea of why the local church exists and why we think membership is important. Finally, number five, that fits with all that we've said, we're to be in mutual submission to each other. Scripture makes it clear that church works as God desires when you submit to me and I submit to you. Paul says this to the church in Ephesus, Be filled with the Spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another. Why? Out of reverence for Christ. What does the word reverence mean? It means awe and fear. 
out of the awe of Christ and what He's done for us and the fear of disappointing Him and earning His displeasure, we're to submit to each other. That doesn't mean one isn't right and one isn't wrong. But that means that if somebody comes to me and says, I have an issue, my job is to listen and, and to search out. And if I have sin in that, I need to own that and turn from it. It means that we give of each other in this mutual relationship that the church is intended to be. So yes, being a member of a local church is the plan of God. Now, I want to say for those who aren't members here, that's okay. That's okay. You don't have to be a member here to come and worship, to serve, to be part of the family. Um, but I'd encourage you to consider it. I'd encourage you to consider it. Because it's the plan of God for us. Now you have to be a member to serve on the administrative council because that's corporate law and we are a corporation by governmental standards. We have uh, articles of incorporation and you have to be a member to vote for the, on, on anything the church officially votes for. But to be here to be part of everything, that's, that's, that's between you and the Lord. And I'm not going to try and be your Holy Spirit. But I want to encourage you to pray over that if you're coming here regularly, if you're tithing here, and you're serving here, why not join the family officially? We'd love to have you. You need me, and I need you, and you need each other. I can't walk the Christian life well on my own. If I don't have accountability, I pastored my last church, um, second to the last church was an independent church. I had no accountability. I was El Guapo. I was the big guy. I hope I didn't just swear. I don't know what El Guapo means, but I heard it on TV a while back. Any Spanish teachers? That's a scary place to be. To be that person in church that you're not accountable to anybody for. Pastors fall all the time because of that. Not only because of sexual sin, though that happens, but it wasn't long ago a very famous pastor in the United States was forced out of his church and it was an ugly thing that destroyed a huge mega church. Because he was just mean and wouldn't take anybody's feedback. And big named pastors from around the country went to him and said, hey man, let's, let's build an accountability group with each other. And his response was, I don't need accountability from someone whose church is smaller than mine. I need you. And you need me. And we need each other. Amen? Can I get an amen? Amen. Thank you. Make the old Pentecostal in me feel good. If most people are honest, the reason we don't join within a local church is because we're unwilling to put ourselves in submission to anyone for any reason. It's just a hard truth. And unfortunately for those folks, the Bible doesn't impact their thoughts in any way, shape, or form. When I was pastoring down south in Nebraska, there was a lady that came to my church every week. She tithed. She was just everything you would think would be a member of the church. But her membership was in a different church across town that she hadn't been to in years, except for when it's time to vote. She always ran over there on the day that it was time to vote so she could have her say in a church she didn't do anything with. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that wasn't God's plan. If you're here, consider it. God gives us leaders that He expects us to be obedient to. 
and fellow believers that we're to be in submission to. That's God's model for the church. 